We're receiving technical assistance from Ida Aronson, the United Holy Nation. Um, I'm Jeffrey Derensberg, Attack Apply Ishak Nation, and Kaylee Dardar of the United Holy Nation. And I'm going to go ahead and start the question, if that's OK mm -hmm. with you, Sierra. Yeah. All right. First of all, basics. What are your name and indigenous nation? And where are you from and where do you reside now? Salho Tupot Sierra Lagarde, Nicha Chata Bayulu Convencia. My name is Sierra Lagarde, and I'm a member of the Bayulu Band of Choctaw from Lacombe, Louisiana. I grew up and currently reside in Bobancha, which is most commonly known as New Orleans, Louisiana. All right, thank you. Or Yakoke, I should say, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, could you please tell us your life story in three minutes or so, just very briefly? Okay, um, so I'm, I'm from a family of farmers, but I grew up in the city. I'm a graduate of Ursuline Academy. I got my BA in history from the University of New Orleans. And since that time, I traveled around the state speaking in high schools and at universities, you know, sometimes alongside some of y'all. Uh, just really trying to decolonize um, the history of not only our state, but the nation's history and to bring awareness to Native issues today. All right, thank you. So I want to ask you some questions in terms of like personal identity. What is your own sense of personal identity and did you struggle with this growing up? And it's like, how do you identify or what is your personal history of that understanding? I identify as a Choctaw woman and a Creole woman from Louisiana. Um, I never really questioned my identity. You know, I grew up from a very large, close knit family and a close knit community too, where, you know, people looked like me. We had the same culture. We, you know, we, we had the same experiences. So the really, there was a sense of comfort. There really was never any question of who I was. Um, with that being said, I didn't really start to take an in-depth look at my family history until I was about a junior uh, in high school. And that was through learning American history and uh, especially during the 20th century, the, eight, the 19th and 20th centuries when we learned about the oppression and slave trade and just you know the Jim Crow laws and just and everything that surrounded that you know, I started to question, well, why in this history, in this state, like, why am I more, more as seen as Creole, more as Black, and what happened to the Native side of the state's history? Why is it just always, you know, French, Creole, Black? You never really hear anything. And so that's when I really started to question myself, why is it in my family that when we, t when we talk about who we are culturally, you know, it's understood that we're Native, that we're Choctaw people, and on my mother's side that we're Apache, but why is it that that's not automatically said? Why do we just say Creole and just accept that? And that's where I really started to try to address that, that issue. Did so. you find that in school they discussed anything, like it was you were you more inspired by things they said about Native people that were wrong or just a sort of omission or something like that? It was the gaslighting. Um, Can you explain? I grew up, that? yeah. So at Ursuline, you know, it's a very, um, <laughs> it's a very monocolored school, and uh, you know, me already being the, in the minority, the teachers in itself, there, there's a certain way of, of teaching American history, and especially the part where they do talk about, you know, the the Europeans coming over to the Americas and then manifest destiny. It, it was problematic for me because it seemed that they glorified, the, especially the depiction of manifest destiny. There was a, a, a romanticization of it. And that's what I, what I didn't like, you know? And I found that every time I tried to address that, you know, to the school, well, hey, you know, the way that you're presenting this topic of history is very one-sided and it's dangerous because it glorifies in a, the not only the subjectification but the oppression and the ultimate genocide of an entire race of people. That this is very problematic for people, you know, for 
for teenagers my age that are growing up, you know, learning this history, you know, it's, it's almost like it was like tooth and nail trying to, to tell them, hey, let's look at it from another perspective. Let's teach, let, let's teach Western expansion, Western expansion, but let's teach it from both sides, not just from, you know, not just one side, you know, from the American perspective. And I think that that's not something that was really, um, that was really understood by that school. You know, and I'm talking about a school whose mascots were literally called the Sioux. So yeah, I seem to recall that they did make some use of native mascots there at Ursuline. Uh, was that problematic for you when you were a student there? It, it was. Um, at the time, I didn't really realize until I actually got out of school until I graduated. But at the time, I saw that and I'm like, mm, that is kind of that's kind of weird. But um, you know, you're, you're you're a teenager. You're you're surrounded. What are you What are you gonna do? You know, and and, the, and this was this is before social media really took off and before you know people really started to organize and say, hey, you know, let's take a look back and you know objectively and see how problematic this is. You know, it, it, that was that was before that time. So. Did I like it? No, not not really. But um, where I'm at now, I'm I'm glad that they that they took that out. You know, especially with the um after 2016 with the Standing Rock protests and and the subsequent protests afterwards, when people really started to understand Native issues, Earthline actually did take accountability for that. And so I commend them for that. I'm just it's just it took decades, but yeah, that was that was very. <laughs> That was, that was very bad. You mentioned that your identity was just seen as more Creole. How do you describe what Creole means or what do you think the term Creole means in terms of how people were applying it to you? So the way, you mean the way other people see it or the way it is? Uh, either one or both. Uh, I know a lot of people use that word and there might be people you know, who aren't as familiar with it. Um, so what's your understanding or like when people said you were Creole and didn't recognize your nativeness, how do you understand what they thought Creole was? I'm sorry, you, you cut out a little bit. I'm sorry. So when people said you were Creole and didn't recognize that you were also Choctaw, what was their understanding of what Creole is? Okay, I understand. Uh, so they just under, they just thought that it was French and black, and that was it. And and I do have to say for the record that you know there are many different um, definitions of Creole throughout the Americas. Um, specifically, Louisiana Creole is any person that is descended from the French or the Spanish or both. You know, sometimes French and Spanish they mix. The Af oh, who had interrelations with the Africans and the Native Americans. In South Louisiana. So that's what, you know, when we, when we make the term Louisiana Creole, that's what that encompasses. Black, I mean, uh, Black, Native American, French, and Spanish. Um, what I think non-Creoles think of, of when they talk about it and when they read about it, they just think, oh, you're just, you know, French and, and Black, you know. The, it's like the, the, the Native aspect in, um, in Creole and what is Louisiana Creole is completely omitted when a lot of Louisiana Creole culture stems from Southeastern Muskogean um, and specifically Choctaw culture. Can you give us some examples of like stuff that you would do, like maybe um, you mentioned like uh, Choctaw influence in Creole culture, especially your area. Um, can you give us some examples of things that people might associate with being Creole that have a native influence? Yes, so uh, in my hometown in, uh, in Lacombe, there's a place that's called Bonfoca. A lot of people, you know, our language, a lot of people think that Bonfoca is a Creole word for good village, when actually it's not, it's Bokfuka, it's a Choctaw word, Bokfuka. Um, and that was named after one of our chiefs, Chief Bokfuka, who lived in the 1740s. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people don't realize that a lot of our words were gallicized. Um, another word is bayou, comes from my word bayou, which is a, uh, which is a dialect of our area of Choctaw that doesn't exist in Mississippi. You know, so not only in our language, but also in our food, when people think of 
Creole cuisines, they think of grits and cornbread, you know, um, all these rich flavors, when that actually comes from, from our food sources, you know? So there, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of, of Choctaw influences in Creole culture in that way. Given uh, that you are part of a, uh, a Choctaw band, what is your general relationship or the, with the larger Choctaw world? Uh, there, of course, there are Choctaw nation, you know, there are Choctaw tribes in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama even, which are kind of more traditional homelands. And of course, there are Choctaw, there's a Choctaw tribe in Oklahoma and from the removal and of course, Choctaw people all over. What's your sort of relationship uh, with them? Your it's, it still fascinates me at, at just how large we are. You know, like you said, we're, we're all Choctaw, we're all one people, but, you know, I, I think that um, over the years I've gotten to, I've been lucky enough to make friends with people who are from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Gina Band and the, uh, and the Miss, people from Mississippi. You know, I mean, I know Virginia who's Moa Choctaw. So it's fascinating to me how we're all one people, but the, there are subtle differences, you know, because of where we live, you know, that just little distinctions in our language or in how, or how we cook our food or, you know, just, just little things where if I were to see them, you know, and even if in our weaving, you can tell where someone is from, if they're, if they're a basket weaver, you know, if they're from Oklahoma, or if they're from Mississippi, or even, you know, by uh, where we have our own distinct style of weave, of basket weaving. So just in those things, it's fascinating that even though we're all the same people, there's just little subtle differences, you know, that, that kind of distinguish us from each other, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know uh, your nation, like many non-federally recognized tribes in Louisiana, has many people of African ancestry. What role, if any, does this play in your personal identity? It plays a huge role. It's, it's who I am. It, it's who we are as a people. We, um, the native, the Choctaw people and the African people, the Creole people, we have a long history together. And that history, as you know, as you well know, is stemmed, you know, from oppression, from racism, just growing up in the South. But um, we have to rely on one another to survive. And for me, it's, it just shows the resilience between those two sides of my family, that they, that they came together and they still, and they survived, you know, and th they made it work. They blended cultures and even, you know, throughout everything against them, they still managed to, to maintain who they are, you know, and, and I think that that's something that's important, that that's an important history in itself. You know, a lot of people, uh, talk about, oh, well, you know, the, the tribe here um, in this state or, or, the, or like the, the different tribes in Louisiana, they have this, this type of history or, or so and so. I, I think that the Afro-Indigenous history in Louisiana just doesn't get enough awareness from not only non-Natives, but the Native community in general. Yeah. So. Um, uh, a question, I guess this comes up like maybe in regards to federal recognition. Uh, the Choctaw Bayou Lacombe has been studied by the United States in depth uh, over a century ago. There was an entire book produced about the culture of your people by the United States in 1909, detailing your history, your culture, language, everything like that. Given that this is the case and that your culture was deemed worthy enough of such an in-depth, you know, monograph length study at the time, a time when, if I recall, no indigenous nations in Louisiana had federal recognition. Do you find it odd, confusing, or perhaps infuriating that your nation does not enjoy federal recognition at this time? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, you know, just like for instance, today marks the 119th anniversary uh, uh, of 
the United States Congress signing the Indian removal for the Viola from Choctaw people to go back up to Oklahoma. You know, we have, for us, for people who have such deep roots in this state to constantly be underrepresented is, is very disheartening. It's, and it's frustrating. It, it's like a, it's not a losing battle because, you know, as long as we're still here, as long as we still know our culture and who we are as people, we're not going to be gone. We're not going to be lost. But it's, it's that constant fight for validation that that's really irritating. And, you know, for, for instance, like you said, the government didn't know about us. You know, let's, uh, let's say back in the 1860s, there were 600, over 600 members of our people in, Bio, in the Biolocom area. And not just there, Mandeville and Covington Slidell, all the way up to Madisonville, we had huge territories. And when the Union Army came in, once they took over New Orleans, they came in across Lake Pontchartrain and just decimated our villages. And by the 1870s, we went from over 600 people to barely 200, which was recorded in the New Orleans, I believe it was the New Orleans Democrat, before it became the Times Democrat, I believe it was a, it was a New Orleans Democrat. They even recorded that in their newspapers. That's how, that's how terrible those massacres were. You know, and, and so once the 1870s came and then you had, you know, the 1900s come, you had about 200 of us left and just for, for the United States to then have a second injury removal for us 70 years after the first um, out of Mississippi. And I might add that those members from Mississippi that were in the first removal of the 1830s came and hid with us. And their descendants are now subject, uh, um, subjected to a second removal in 1902 to, to go up there. It's, it's frustrating, it's all because of land, because of resources. And you know, because of the lumber industry and because of constant European encroachment onto our lands. And, yeah, and, and even after that removal, mm -hmm. uh, a hundred and almost some hundred and twenty years ago, they still wrote the book about the Biolacum Choctaw, about the people who are left. So no one mm -hmm. can even say that the people who were removed are the ones they were talking about. They're talking about yeah. the ones that are there now. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> Most people don't even know that no, that, was, that there was a second removal, you know, and it's just, you know, and, and so the, the, the families that, that hid in the woods in that state are, you know, or for instance, my family, you know, and, and there were already some of us who mixed with the, with the French population and with the African population, but we were still Choctaw people and we had to hide. And, you know, so you look at census records and there are census records where there were marked M for mulatto, where it, whereas in fact, we are, we are, we're Choctaw people. And, you know, and it's even in the dolls rolls as our, um, our names being Choctaw people, but it just goes to show you the constant encroachment and just, you know, like, like the strangulation of, of our resources you know, who we are. So Speaking yeah, of, you, you touched upon something like, it seems like the history of your nation is heavily intertwined with the history of extraction in Louisiana. It seems to have had a big influence on your people. Definitely. It still does today. The lumber industry and, uh, and I believe the coal industry was very, was very uh, damaging and destructive to, to who we are, because if it wasn't, it if it wasn't for the cypress and for the valued pine, we would still be there. I mean, that, that, that's just a fact. I mean, there's no reason to live out there in the swamp, in the bayou, if, if those resources weren't valuable for a reason. And, and, and unfortunately, that's what we're still fighting, fighting for today. Um, they, the US government capitalized on the fact that we were decimated twice and uh, before we can get back together to unify ourselves and to, and to put forth a resolution to say, hey, you need to stop this encroachment. Let's set aside some land for ourselves, you know, um, like many of the other tribes did, you know, and draft laws and, and, and try to have that, that um, official document put forth so where we can have our own set of lands. The US government said, nope, hurry up, get them out of there. 
let's go oh you have you have your relatives your cousins are in oklahoma go out there if you look at every editorial that talks about the biolocal removal of 1902 it always says that you know that the government offered us land out there you know they, they, they suggest that we go out there what it was and what i was told in my family is it was either go or die we, we go there voluntarily or they will just kill us kill enough of us until we go so and that that's the unfortunate truth yeah that. people uh i think you know we're kind of removed from well, I guess the Indian Wars have transformed now. They didn't never really quite went away, but that was only, you know, 12 years after the massacre at Wounded Knee. Like it was very recent history. So oh, yeah. it's a very real threat in the minds of probably every native person in the US, I can imagine. Yeah, and, and the, well, the reason why specifically they didn't like us was because we kind of, we would, we would attack some of the settlements you know, like around the uh, the German coast yeah. and stuff. So anytime that they could really try to get rid of us, they, they did, you know, so, yeah. Questions about your personal cultural practice, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I guess the first one is, what cultural practices do you engage in regularly? And sort of what cultural practices would you like to engage in? Mm -hmm. Uh, so right now I am learning basket weaving. I've been doing it for going on three years, if I'm, if I'm thinking correctly. And um, I'm being taught by Tom Colvin, and he learned from my relatives in Viola Colm, uh, Mathilde and Sonville Johnson and um, in the 1960s. And so I'm really happy that he can pass, on, pass that on to me. And um, what I like to learn in the future is more of my language. I would love to learn how to speak more on um, Chaka and um, I think uh, learning more of our traditional foods would be would be nice. So is Tom a member of your tribe? Is that who's teaching you? Or? I like to think of as uh, Chata Yuma, which is you know like a Choctaw <laughs> and like the the, the first Chata Yuma. <laughs> uh, he's, he's pretty much adopted. Yeah. He, <laughs> He call him Chanta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's he's a great guy. He's he's loved across the southeast in Oklahoma. All right. And what do you make these baskets out of? So we make it out of palmetto, tala, and uh, river cane. Um mo mostly oh. palmetto now because river cane is kind of hard now to find uh, in Lacombe just because of you know the overdevelopment. So but, but palmetto is very plentiful. Um over in Mississippi, they predominantly make it out of cane. So, have, do you, have you learn to make anything else out of cane or palmetto? I guess there's other, lots of stuff can be made out of those. Right now, I'm learning uh, how to make a chuka. Uh, so over in uh, the community park in Lacombe, we're building a chuka. You know, just so people can understand more. And what's? Can you explain what that is for people? Yeah, who sorry, might not chuka know? is a, a palmetto house, the Choctaw palmetto house. And um, so we're building that over in um, a community green space, you know, just to really um, show people some of our culture, you know, like, you know, just so kids can see, you know, hey, like this is, this is something, um, part of the traditional history, active history of Lacombe, uh, um, which we called Bochoqua, you know, um, area. And so, so they can, they can see firsthand that it's not just French, it's not just Creole, you know, you have a rich native history here too. It's a very, I, I have worked on one of those houses myself at the Islamio Museum uh, with Monique Verdan, and maybe you've worked on that recurring project as yeah. well, but um, I just felt I learned a lot that I could not have learned any other way. <laughs> For one thing, I really got to appreciate how many palmetto fronds it takes and just, I don't know, I don't know what you, did you have any feelings about the ancestors doing this, like kind of seeing how people really did stuff back in the day? Yeah, I have a lot of respect. <laughs> a lot more respect. You know, the, just the time it takes and the effort, they were, they were strong, they were patient, and they were very good at math to figure out how, how, many, how many leaves it takes. <laughs> <laughs> to make an entire chunk <laughs> out. So, but I love it. it it's, it's fun. It's very hands-on. And, um, and it, it's interesting to you know working with 
uh, Miss Tammy and Monique in building the, uh, you know, like a Homa Palmetto house over in um, St. Bernard, just the little differences between theirs and how we make ours is really cool. You are known regionally as a native dancer. Uh, what role does dance play in your life? And I, I know that you've danced at both powwows and protests. Uh, maybe you could speak about- I think you cut out. How these are connected for you. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, let me just bring the, the screen a little bit closer. You are known regionally as a native dancer. So what role does dance play in your life? Uh, you've danced at both powwows and protests. Maybe you could speak about how these are connected. So, so yes, I'm a, I'm a jingle dress dancer. Um, I, let's see, I think powwows and protests are connected. You know, there, there was a, a point in time when having a powwow was the protest, you know, when it, when it was outlawed. So in my style of dancing and, you know, being a jingle dress dancer, I'm so thankful that the Ojibwe people blessed us, you know, blessed Indian country with that style of dance where, you know, they allow us to dance this, the sacred dance. And so when I go to a powwow, I'm praying, you know, who are no longer able to dance, people who could never dance, you know, just from some affliction or, you know, or, or something. and you know, just, just for healing in my own life, you know, or, or, or maybe there are prayers that people ask me to, to pray for them. You know, it's, it's almost like, like church to me. And so when I go to a protest, it's, it's the same thing. You know, you're, you're at, you're praying for healing for whatever issues that I need of brothers and sisters are going through. And, and sometimes we're, we're dancing at protests, you know, for our black brothers and sisters for healing for the same thing. You know, I, I, I think the greatest form of uh, solidarity was when, you know, a lot of the people up in um, up north, you know, a lot of jingle dress, jingle dress dancers came down and, and danced for one of the protests for George Floyd. You know, I think it's transcendent of how a lot of our issues are so common and, you know, so similar that, that the jingle dress dance can, can, can be performed and, you know, for healing and for, you know, there's a sacred space for that. So, yeah. So, uh, what do you think about some of the powwows of some, but definitely not all federally recognized tribes in Louisiana that do not allow members of non-federally recognized tribes to participate as dancers? I know the Tunica Biloxi powwow definitely does allow uh, this probably, I, I imagine, because they remember I mean, their federal rec recognition was definitely within my lifetime. But what do you mm -hmm. think about that? Like when you try to dance at a powwow, you might be excluded. Mm. I don't go. <laughs> I don't. I don't go to powwows that don't include everyone. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I think it's. I. I, I think in a way it's um, kind of ironic, the fact that as native peoples, we can decide who's native, who's not, you know, when traditionally that wasn't our way of doing things. So, you know, it just, it kind of, it, there's that colonial mindset, you know, where, and that's where that stems from, you know, the, you're not, if you don't. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. So the blood quantum, the, the blood quantum issue, you know, where you're so, uh, you know, they count, your your native ancestry based on how many you know how further back your great grandparent was as a full blood you know you know if if your mother was a full blood then you're half you know and your grandparents and you're a quarter you know that that blood quantum issue to and it, and it was basically a system to phase out native peoples you know and because of our dwindling, dwindling numbers we'd have to marry outside the tribe which would further dilute the blood you know, therefore, oh, not enough blood quantum, well, then you're not native enough, you know. So that's where that that uh, type of thinking comes from. And so, you know, transformed to the 21st century, we're going to powwows, you know, 
<laughs> that same mindset is still intact with a lot of federally recognized tribes. You know, uh, if you don't have a CDIB card, then, oh, well, you're not permitted to dance. Where isn't the powwow in the first place, isn't it supposed to be a celebration of life, a celebration of our culture, of, of our intertribal culture? You know, not for, not for money, not for clout. You know, if I were to play devil's advocate, I could probably say, well, you know, it's just about maintaining your, you know, that uh, the people who compete actually are of native descent, you know, so people don't don't come in and, and pretend, you know, like a pretendian or something and take, you know, tribal funds and, and money and stuff like that. Okay, maybe I can understand that, but that's a slippery slope. You know, where do you draw the line on that argument? So for me, you know, you cannot make the argument of we're not recognized as a people, the US government and the Canadian government and the governments of Mexico, Central and South America aren't listening to indigenous voices. If you're not listening to the indigenous voices of your mixed blooded uh, native peoples who are not federally recognized, that are underrepresented and often ignored, you know, by our own people, you're part of the problem. Meanwhile, the guys sitting up in the White House and the, and the big wigs and stuff up in Congress, they're just sitting there folding their arms laughing. So, you know, it's, I think it's very, I think it's hypocritical, it's, it's ironic. But at, at, at the end of the day, if that's how you want to go about doing things, that's fine. You go, you go right on ahead, but I'm not going to support it. Um, I'm not going to support, an, an, um, I want to say an institution, but uh, um, that manner of doing things. Um, Thank you for that uh, answer. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of protests, since we were just talking about that, um, recently there was an attempt on the part of the state of Louisiana to allow a private hotel complex at Fontainebleau State Park, which, as I understand, is a place that is sacred to your people uh, up near where you are from. That plan failed due to widespread opposition uh, from a variety of groups, uh, but it does bring up the question of whether and how your people can stop development on your sacred sites, or what are your thoughts on this? So that's just, it's like a never ending series of battles in the same war. You know, it's, we're, we're, con it's, we're constantly fighting. It's, as long as we're not federally recognized, you know, um, we're not going to have the say in protecting our sacred lands and our history, our heritage. You know, so what do you do after that? You fight. And unfortunately, like you said, there was uh, the Nungesser incident, you know, with um, with development in Fontainebleau State Park, which we, which our people called Hachinchuba, you know, the place of the alligator. And there's that that place is like you said it's one of our last sacred areas for our for our tribe and so th and this is the constant thing that we have to deal with it's the saint tammany parish governments and the state governments who are so disconnected from their own history you know not too far back their own ancestors had to rely on the land to survive you know now they just live in big houses you know big corporate buildings and they go in their homes and then that's it. They're so disconnected. They don't realize just how much this land affects who they are, you know, affects their livelihoods. You know, so to have issue, just to say, don't develop a state park, don't develop this. If you wanna look at it as a park and not as someone's uh, history, so someone's cultural history, fine. You know, but to say that we're developing because it's not being used, that that's the type of mentality, ridiculous mentality that that we as the Biola Contract people have to constantly battle every single year. And, and it seems to come back uh, about every two to three years, you know, we'll fight it, it'll get shut down. And then, oh, uh, a city council member will bring it up again, you know, three, four years thinking that we forgot about it. So. You, you've done uh, educational speaking and uh, cultural demonstrations uh, in many different areas. Do you feel that, is that something you've often had to do when you do this sort of 
presentations? Is that something you often have to do to remind people of their connection to the land that maybe they once had or still have and are ignoring? I'm, I'm, you're breaking up, Jeff. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Sierra. Uh, so you've done cultural work okay. and presentations many different places. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. is that something you have often had to do to remind people of their historical or present connection to the land that they're on? Once I became more much it is a I did. Um, I didn't really. I didn't really understand just the importance of of, of having this of these issues known until, like I said, like um, until after I got out of college, you know. And then I, when I started learning more myself, just the lack of knowledge, you know. And I, I sort of felt a responsibility. And and I'm I'm glad that I have you know a team of of y'all behind me, you know, and 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 other members of the Native community. Not just in Bobancho, but across Louisiana and the Southeast that do the same thing, that go out and educate people. Um, because it is it is very frustrating. Um, so so yeah, to answer your question, I, I I do think it's a responsibility for me to go to go out and teach that because if we don't, then the people who are in power are just wanting to exploit that ignorance and you know try try to wipe it away. Uh, you sp we've spoken about different uh, layers of removal that the Choctaw Bayou Lacombe have endured. And when I think about this, I think about some paintings that um, I think you had come to a talk I did, or maybe I'd shown you some paintings uh, from an exhibition at NOMA, New Orleans yeah, Museum of Art last year, Inventing Acadia. And uh, one of the more famous images of indigenous people in Louisiana, one that's often reprinted is March d'Indiens de la Louisiana, the March of the Indians by Alfred Boisseau in 1849. Uh, that depicts native people, likely Choctaw. Uh, most people identify them as being Choctaw and he definitely painted many Choctaw people. And they are kind of leaving the area. They're walking westward into the sunset. It contains a motif later found in uh, the most famous probably the most famous American painting of Manifest Destiny, John Gass, mm -hmm. 1872 painting, American Progress, which shows natives walking again to the left, leaving the scene as white people populate the West. And yet in 1900, uh, you and I looked at a painting by Alphonse Gamot. And it seemed to be a pretty accurate depiction of a Choctaw fishing camp. <laughs> They're right there where they are supposed to be. And then 1909, Bushnell has photographs of your people using the same items such as the blow guns and the baskets that are in the painting by Boisseau. It seems to be this constant narrative that y'all are leaving, but then you're also constantly being depicted as being there. Um, is that something you have to struggle against? You know, people seem to have a deep-seated notion that y'all have <laughs> left, and yet it's very easy to photograph you being there. <laughs> even today uh is that something you have to struggle with i want to make you laugh <laughs> just about four years ago i went to a protest and uh where i was uh, asked to be a guest speaker and before i i went up to speak the person before me you know on the microphone to make the point of you know just how destructive you know colonization was even till today you know, on, on, on the Native community, the fact that the Biolacombe Choctaw people are no longer here when we were such a rich, vast <laughs> people, you know, this, that, that just shows just how, how bad if we don't check this colonization crap, you know, where it stands right now. And you could just imagine how awkward it was when I got up there and introduced myself in my language as a Biolacombe Choctaw <laughs> woman. Uh, that that person felt, uh, which by the way, I might add, they later apologized. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's just, that just proves to you right there what I'm talking about that. And, and that person was, was native, that was a native person that they didn't even know that we're right there in their backyard, you know, and that we're, that, it, so it, it, it's laughable, but at the same time, it's, it's my job and, it, and it's my uh, my my uh, people of my community job to, to go out there and 
and to say, hey, you know, we're not dead, we're not relics, we're not in a painting. You know, we're still here. Our culture is active. You know, come see us. Come, let, let us show you and talk to you about who we are as a people and, and share our histories together. You know, so, uh, you know, e even I was speaking with uh, Miss Evelyn Steele, who's uh, a basket weaver from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, whose family came from Lacombe um, in, the remo in the second removal. And, and even she would say, you know, yeah, I grew up, you know, learning from my parents and my grandparents that, you know, we were by Lacombe Choctaw people and we came over here, you know, so yeah, we know about you, but, you know, unfortunately, a lot of members, you know, that are your, that are my age, don't really know that they come from the Bayou Lacombe Choctaw people. They just think that they're Oklahoma Choctaw, you know, so it's just, it's, <laughs> is that constant fight for recognition, you know, just just from my fellow natives, just from my brothers and sisters, come on, man. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so when you say, you know, we'd like to show you our culture, uh, what are some things you would like to show people? Like, uh, I understand there is a museum uh, near, uh, near Lacombe mm -hmm. that has, or in Lacombe? Maybe? Yeah, it's in Lacombe. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk to us about uh, the museum and what sort of items it has and what your involvement with that has been? So it's a Bayou, it's called the Bayou Lacombe Museum. And uh, recently we, uh, we have uh, an exhibit, a section of the museum, not an exhibit, a section of the museum that talks about the um, Bayou Lacombe Choctaw culture and the influence that it has in the history of the area. And, uh, and it has a, a, a giant, it's like, it's like a type of wall where there's numerous pictures of, you know, just like uh, our day-to-day -day activities, you know, um, uh, our, um, just showing like how we planted and um, parts of our agriculture and, and how we wove, wove our baskets and their, um, there's there's other artifacts in there. Some of our baskets are in there. You know, it talks. Um, there, there's uh, excerpts of that talks about our history. You know, so it uh, there's a lot that that um that that museum covers. You know, the, my goal is to have a separate Bayou Lacombe Choctaw Museum sometime in the future that that is dedicated to um to our tribe's uh, culture, like you know, a cultural center. That would be that would be amazing. But the, but for now, it's like a it's a museum that that kind of culminates between the French and the Creole and the Choctaw. The museum in Bayou Lacombe, uh, were you involved in setting up the, the exhibit they have or did the members of the tribe currently living members contribute to it? Mm -hmm. So was it the yeah, well, so, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, more of like a, a cultural consultant. Um, yeah, one of my cousins, uh, yeah, she's a tribal member and she uh, she's on the board. She's, I believe she's the curator of the museum and a board member. And so she really um, gets uh, a lot of um, the the baskets and other artifacts to put into the museum and does the research, you know, uh, the proper research of where it comes from, which family, who did, who who made this or, or you know, just, just a history um, about it, you know, for the museum. So. And so much since we're talking about um, sort of preserving culture, what would you like to leave behind for future generations of Bayou Lacombe people or just for future generations in general? I would like to leave behind um, knowledge, access to knowledge, um, you know, where the next generation can you know, the, the next generation of my tribe can grow up and, and have access to their history. And, you know, without having to learn it in some, you know, some school book somewhere, you know, I would like to, to finally have a place where we can have a center, um, a permanent place set up for our people, you know, where we could uh, expand and and, and really ground ourselves and organize to where we could settle and 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 flourish like that, you know. Right right now, it's just like we're working off of where we can, you know. Um, I would like to have a more permanent place if, in the Lacombe area, 
or just in St. Tammany or on the North Shore, just in general, you know, for my community. How do you see technology playing a role in that and sort of preservation or is that something you imagine as being yeah. a pathway for the future? Yeah, so I don't see why not. Um, you know, to, I'm not a tech person, but uh, I do know that technology used correctly can definitely help, you know, in preservation and, um, and help ultimately help us achieve what we're trying to do over, over in Lacombe. So. Mm -hmm. And how generally, how generally would you like to be portrayed? Uh, as a person who cares about her culture and her people, um, I'm, I'm immensely proud of where I come from. You know, just the struggles that my family, my, you know, the, the native side and the black side, you know, what we had to go through just to survive. And that's a legacy that I could teach to the next generation. And in the future, my kids, I would, you know, that's something that I would love to happen. All right. I think, uh, Haley, thank you for all these uh, wonderful answers. I think Haley has a few questions for you. Uh, Haley, uh, would you like to just pop in or would you yeah. like to? All right. Yeah, so I have a few questions. Thank you so much for this. Um, I'm just moving you over. <laughs> I've, I've been beating while I'm, I'm listening to you on my television. But, um, so the question that I had was I'm thinking like in listening to you, I'm, I'm thinking about what people may want to know. Um, part of this project is um, getting people together and having a conversation with people and compensating them for their time with the idea that we're able to answer some questions for people online. Um, you know, who may be wanting to get some more a better sense of, of what is unrecognized uh, or state recognized tribes in Louisiana and, and what are some members and what are they thinking? Um, so I was trying to think of like, what are some questions that people may have while you're, while we're listening to this? And um, one thing that I thought of, I, I really appreciated listening to a lot of your answers. And I feel like you covered, we covered a lot of stuff. Um, one thing that I felt like it was still kind of lingering in the back of my head when I'm listening to this is like, you've mentioned multiple times how important it is for your community to do this, um, it, how important, um, which I completely understand. Um, but I'm wondering if you could give a better definition or describe a little bit about what is your community or who do you think is your community? Um, is it is your tribe your community? Is your family? Um, is there a larger community out of it? I guess, what are the, the communities of your indigeneity? Are you there? No. Is everybody gone? Uh, I'm still here. Okay. Hello? Oh, you're, you're good? Hello? Can it, hello? Hey, yes. Okay, you're there. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so when I met Babette was my, um, my tribe community, you know, the Biola Choctaw, and, and my family, too, you know, um, you know, for instance, like, we're, so we're not state recognized, we're not federally recognized, so it's really, it's up to us to organize ourselves, and, and to come together, you know, and, and it's, it's the descendants of the people who stayed, you know, you know like, for instance, you know, like the Ducrees, the Riviers, the Cousins, and, you know, the different different families who stayed um, in Lacombe. Uh, you know, I don't like to say, I mean, I say descendants, but in reality, what I mean is, you know, we're not descendants of the Choctaw people. We are the Choctaw people of Valle Lacombe. And it's, it's my, my mission is to organize everybody back who were scattered after Katrina and to really just come together and, and, and set a place for ourselves, you know, in, um, or to tell, to, to have a place uh, as a community where we can say, hey, this is who we are. Let's, let's have a place where we can go to and organize and figure out 
how to move forward as a tribe, how to, to, well, what's, what's the next stage, you know, um, to, 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 to better relate our issues, you know, um, don't, don't let you, let's not just do it from one person here, one person there in this, in this, um, town or in the, you know, or back in Chalmette where some, some of our, uh, tribe, tribe, uh, tribal members live, you know, let's come and then let's, you know, let, let's set a page up, let's set a, um, a, a website up that tells people who we are, you know, organize. You know, right now we're, we're suffering from so many splinter groups that take away our name and use it for themselves that if you Google by you look home, talk to people, you don't know what is the truth and what's not, you know? And so what my mission is when I talk about my, my community is getting everybody back organizing everybody back and let's make a plan of action to to really try to solidify ourselves as the bio again so that we can make our issues better heard to the state government you know and and to the national government hopefully you know if when, when it gets that far we can get that far so I'm sorry, I, I, I was kind of rambling there, but I hope that cleared it up a little bit. No, no, this is why we asked, it was a great answer. One yeah. question that I had, hello, can you hear me? I'm sorry, my yeah, internet. Yeah, I can hear you. My internet's not the best today. Uh, that was a great answer. I'm, I'm thinking also of like, um, yeah, and I'm just thinking of, do you think it's an accident that you guys are, are splintered out? No, no, not at all. They, um, like I told Jeffrey, this is, this has been planned, you know, it's like the government tried to succeed, you know, in, in splitting everybody out of everybody apart, just like they tried to do, you know, with the removals and, and other different native tribes too, you know? Um, so I don't, this was, this was done on purpose. Luckily they didn't kill us all, you know, mm -hmm. luckily we, we still know who we are. Uh, I think the purpose is now to just come back together, you know? What do you feel like would, like, if you were talking to an infinite box of resources, time, and people, what do you think you would grab out of it, or what do you think it would take to kind of do that togetherness that you're, that you need for your community? I would need patience <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point uh, yeah. do you want to talk about that <laughs> well you know everybody everybody is like in their own lives you know um urban indianism is a very real thing you know a lot of people don't really want to go back to what it is you know to be traditional or, or even learn a lot of our traditional ways, you know. Um, you know, even in my case, I have a lot of family members, you know, younger cousins who are so into their phones, and you know that they don't, you know, why, why would I need to learn how to dance, or why would I need to, you know, and not how all dancing are, are social dances, or why would I need to know how, you know, what what some of my languages or how to weave or something, you know, it's 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 things like that, and and that and and also. It's just about people who kind of grew outside of the tribe, but who are still Bayou Lukum Chaka and re-indigenizing their identity, you know, bringing them back to the culture. That's, that, that's part of where that patience comes from. Um, a, another, I think another thing we would need is understanding and an open mind and in a way of try, um, let's try and figure out where to move forward, you know, as a people, what, what is the steps that we need to take? You know, um, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna have, you know, no, gonna take a, a, a group, you know, and, and so that's where that, that teamwork comes in. Um, it's just, it's just gonna be a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of patience, a lot of, um, uh, new ideas, you know, so, but I, I mean, I believe we can do it. You know, we weren't, if we're still here, you know, obviously that's for a reason. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to work with that and then move forward. 
Um, yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> about I'm thinking about what you've said today and and the messages that you've gotten across and you know mm -hmm. I'm thinking about do you know who you think who would you like to hear what you've said today if you had the audience of your choice who would who would you want to hear about you I would like I would like some members of the Talk to the Nation of Oklahoma to hear. I would like the Mississippi Band of Talk to people to hear us because a lot of our people intermarried with them. A lot of our clans married together. So there's a deep history with them. Uh, I would like for them to know about us. Also, I would I would like, I would just like the the community and and by community I mean non-natives to hear about us because I think that they they see us as a past tense they see our issues and what we went through as that of the past when these are very uh these are very real very you know <laughs> very active issues that we still suffer from today and I think once uh, uh, my hope is once they realize that this is in their backyard that they're willing to take a step back and look and figure out, well, what is, how am I contributing to this problem? And I, I've seen that already, you know, just in my fight with, with Nungesser, you know, um, with uh, Fountain Blue State Park. You know, once a lot of people realized, you know, when, uh, when me and some of my, uh, my uh, members of my, my tribe spoke up, you know, at the council meeting and people realized, wait, there are Choctaw people here? What? You know, and then, you know, and, and when we spoke about how this legislation, how this resolution affects us and how it'll in turn affect them. Well, I never really looked at it that way because they're not exposed to it. Mm -hmm. So that's really my hope that my message, um, what we talked about today, it really gets out to. It gets out to the, the native community too of the issues that we have to deal with as non as not uh, non federally recognized people as mixed Afro indigenous people that we have to suffer sometimes even worse from our own native brothers and sisters the oppression and the biasness but also the issues you know with the non native community you know and to show that you know that hey this is very much alive today and that we need you you need to take accountability and help us figure out you know well where can we move forward respectfully you know to, to solve these issues i feel like a lot of what we're, we're doing here is kind of you know setting a platform or just kind of demystifying things um what are some questions that you that you often get asked about your your culture or your background that you're either surprised by or just kind of like or or things that you often are asked about i'm asked about uh this one's a this is a big one but i'm asked uh am am i associated with the Mardi Gras indians oh are you Mardi Gras indians? oh it, this is where the the Bayoulokong Choctaw, uh, you know, misinformation comes from that I was talking about earlier. That that's that's the most common one. When I work at uh, when I do the cultural events over at Jazz Fest and and when I when I speak um, at at schools, you know, and I'll talk about that, you know, especially kids in in New Orleans, they always they they hear Indian, they think, oh, cool, I want to go Indian, you know, and then they they ask me about that, and then, you know, so if it's not them, then other other. Uh, Native peoples will say, hey, aren't you part of that, you know, Mardi Gras Indian, you know, by, by you look home, Ogla people, you know, and so it, it's about clearing that up. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm thankful that once, you know, I actually like that question. I prefer to have that question asked because it gives me the opportunity to clear the air and to say, hey, no, you know, every group has splinter groups. You know, this is not who we are as people. Let me show you. Let me explain to you who we are you know, and, and what we're not, you know, and so it, it, it just leaves that open for conversation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm hearing from that, that you don't, you and you, you're not necessarily against answering that question. If someone asks it to you. 
Right. I'm not against it now. Yeah. And I, I'm not even against um, talking to, to other members, to people who are participating as a Mardi Gras Indian. You know, I've, I've had friends who are Mardi Gras Indians. Um, I always believe that if you have a problem with something, you know, I would like to speak to the person about to see why they do what they do. You know, I just don't want to come in, you know, with my preconceived notions or whatever, even though, you know, you know, you with the feathers and the headdress and stuff. I'm like, okay, but why is it that you do this? You know, so, you know, but I'm always open to that conversation. I guess um, this, is, this is another thought that I'm having is that like, if you're, you're open to conversations, I'm wondering if there was an ever an experience, maybe not about this topic or just in general, where you've, you're in a conversation with someone and you're like, this is a little too much. This is this is a lot. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of those instances. <laughs> um, okay, one was when I had to prove that that I was native, <laughs> by by a by a black woman who was a Monterey Indian. <laughs> And she said that I was the re that she was the real Indian, and this is uh, that she's the only one that should be addressed as such. And even though she went to a fundraiser for Standing Rock to support, you know, people up there in Standing Rock, but uh, you know, I mean, but it's not just Mardi Gras Indians. It's um, sometimes it's it's just when when I speak to other people about you know me being black and native at the same time that it's like the, the the biasness in the native community to black people it's just it's like okay all right you know and, and, and it's shocking sometimes you know when people they look at me they don't even know they don't know that i'm black you know like a lot of natives don't don't know that i'm black and it's shy i mean i know i'm black i look in the mirror i'm just like i see a black woman i see a native woman but it, it to to hear sometimes when I'm in conversations with other natives and and they don't know that I'm I'm part black and then they talk about black people or they talk about you know native and black mixing and having you know kids and stuff you know and like yeah I don't I don't think all that mixing should happen I'm just it just it, it does get tiring at times you know so but pe people are you know you can you can make your argument you could you could tell people you know well hey you know maybe, maybe look at it this way but at the end of the day people are going to believe what they want so mm -hmm. once i just once i say my piece you know that's fine and then i just move on <laughs> so i'll give myself a heart attack yeah. with all that stress <laughs> so. sometimes you know there's these things that like sometimes you're walking around i feel like personally that like I walk around and I'm like oh god just please don't ask me about this one thing today you know and I just walk around with this idea that was like I please just this is the one thing I just don't want to talk about and then there's other days where I walk around and I'm like please someone please ask me about where I got my t-shirt like yeah, <laughs> so much to yeah. say about this is there anything that you feel that way about that you're just like wow I wish you know, I wish conversations went more in this direction because I would love to talk to people about this. I'm sorry, you, you cut out at the last part. Oh no, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Yeah, I was saying, is there anything that you feel like you wish people would ask more that you just really like talking about? Hmm. I like talking about like uh our social dances. I like talking about uh, like, I don't know what tribe were you? Hello. Want to ask me more about that, and you know, you know more about like you know where I come from, who are my people, you know, you know what what are some of the things that we do, you know, what are foods and stuff. I, I love talking about that, and and then and how a lot of our ways are, are very similar to of other tribes. There's some things that we do that's in the Homa. You know, or the, or or even you know, like with with the Creole, you know how like how Choctaw and Creole, how there's some similarities. I, I like talking about that stuff. You know, the the indigenous aspect of Louisiana history. I I love that, and I wish that that was taught more. You know, I was like I I, I light up 
or something <laughs> when 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 people ask me about that like okay well what was the original oh no are you hello hello I wish people would ask me more about that. Hello? Oh, hold on, Sierra. Hello? Hello? Hey, Sierra, the last thing I think we could hear you say was when can, people can ask you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, maybe oh. if you're having trouble oh, with internet, okay. maybe we can just do audio because that way it would be less bandwidth. I don't know what Ida thinks about that. But the last thing that we could hear you say is people ask me what was the original and that's when you cut off. Yeah. Hello, I'm, so, I'm sorry about that, it cut off. Oh, okay. I, I was saying like maybe we could try with you just doing audio and maybe that would decrease the bandwidth on your internet. Okay, I I, uh, I took my Wi-Fi off, so I'm on uh, 5G now. Uh, okay, that's what I had to do too. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the last thing we could hear you say was, you said people ask me what was the original and at that point that was when it cut off so we didn't get to hear what was the original okay. like oh mystery. okay <laughs> mystery <laughs> well what i mainly said was uh i wish people asked me more about you know like the uh the original oh yeah the original history of louisiana the the, the indigenous history you know and 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 how it's so alive today i mean the the, the place names just even in in New Orleans, in Wilmot, you know, like Chapatulis, you know, it's like the the Gallicized version of Achatula, you know, the Falling Rivers people, and you know, and like the Oklapinsa, you know, the Watchers, the Seeing People, just different things in Louisiana that are so steeply rooted in Native history. That's so fascinating, you know, and even like I said, um, with the relations with the Creole culture and that with the Choctaw culture, you know, it's just it's really fun. It's in fascinating and, and I wish more people would ask me about that because just it's like oh yeah well let me tell you this da 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 da, da. so <laughs> yeah well let me ask you a question all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well you know I'm I'm part of a language project so the obligatory language question of like um how are you what is your relationship with you know your indigenous language and how did that begin and where are you on it my my relationship is very much like a little kindergartner <laughs> <laughs> i uh it is uh very basic so i mean like i can introduce myself you know um say how i'm doing you know just you know the basics but um but as like the history of, of certain areas and and oh, I was and where, thinking more of like where did you where did you learn what you've learned and and what does it mean to you? Oh, just from speaking um with some of my Choctaw friends, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's how I was able to learn. And um, you you asked what it means to me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's it's so it means everything to me. You know, mm -hmm. language is identity, and it's part of your identity. And I think that's part of a major step of relearning who we are. You know, Choctaw was, um, the last time Choctaw was spoken in Lacombe was in the 19th century memory to a lot of people. So, you know, whereas now um, uh, a lot of my tribal, a lot of my tribes speak French, I want to reincorporate Choctaw into, back into our tribe and, and for myself, I wanna learn because that's my family history. You know that that's that's my culture. So, and I think Choctaw is a beautiful language. So, <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything that you? I that was that was my questions. Um, do you have anything that we haven't covered that you feel like we need to cover? Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um. I think the history of it sounds I don't want I don't want to go like way off topic, but just to top, um sort of emphasize the history of race relations in Louisiana. Yeah. And why and why I think a lot of us um are so marginalized. Um yeah. is be, um like for instance, a lot of people think, oh, Louisiana was because it's in the South, you know, it has the same experiences as that of Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina. 
when in um in our family in South Louisiana, there was no, you know, black, white, I mean, there was no Hispanic, uh, uh, Middle Eastern, Asian, you know, if you weren't white, then you were black. And, you know, I wanted to make that point to, uh, to Jeffrey when he asked me that question earlier about, you know, has my African, um, has, me, has me grown up with um, being black and being needed, like, how, how was that affected my family? You know, it, especially on my mom's side, growing up in Opelousas, my mom is Lipan Apache, whose family comes from uh, South Texas. And their people, uh, her father would tell her, you know, you have five blood types in you. You're Indian, you're Spanish, you're French, you're Black, and you're white. You know, in this house, you're Indian. But when you walk out of this house, you're Negro. And that's that mentality that has been passed down to a lot of our uh, indigenous people in South Louisiana today, you know, where it, it just takes one generation, you know, um, with that, with, with that mindset, and then boom, that's gone, you know? So you have a whole class of people that in just one generation has forgotten who they are because of the, the oppression of the Jim Crow laws, you know? And, and, I, and that's what frustrated me. That's what got me into really being passionate about learning who I learn relearning who who my family is you know what what my culture is you know um is that why do we have to say that we're creole that we're just creole why why can't we just say that I'm a creole I'm creole but I'm also a native woman I'm also a Choctaw woman I'm also you know partly Pon Apache my mother's people are Lee Pon Apache why why is that you know there's nothing there's nothing black about my mom, even though like she had like she, her grandfather was black, but everyone else on my mother's side of the family, her father, her grandfather, they're all Lee Pond Apaches, whose names are on the rolls of the missions of Hidalgo, Texas as Lee Pond Apache, you know, and so, but they grew up as Negro in, in Louisiana. So it, it's, that, it's that anger um, that that's where that stems from. And, you know, and so when I, when I talk about Louisiana history, I, I always talk, always come from the fact that when you, people who are black, a lot of times people aren't just black, people had to say they're black because, you know, if you were a native, then you were killed, you know, or you had even less rights than, than black people did. So that, that was, that was a, um, that was a point I forgot to make earlier, but, but yeah, so. Thank you for adding that in. I really yeah, appreciate that. I covered that. Do you consider yourself an activist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you have. I think I have to be. <laughs> I mean, if we're not activists, then we're we're just going to be stepped down upon. You know, you know, if you don't stand up for yourself, you don't stand up to the bully. Then you're just constantly going to be all uh, knocked down you know, and, and, and forgotten about. And I, I, in a way I'm, you know, you're kind of born into it. So if you care about, if you care about your culture, if you care about your land and your history, you, you have to be to preserve it. I know this last year has been, been a wild ride uh, for, for the internet speaking, for the history who may not know when this interview was taken, it was just taken in 2020. 2021. So this is like right after, you know, the pandemic and COVID. But as I'm wondering, you know, there's a lot of bleakness. Um, I'm wondering if what is it that you maybe personally or within your community, what is it that you're looking forward towards or what's on the horizon for you that makes you excited? Hmm. Um, well, I'm excited that um, I'm excited that the worst is over. That, uh, you know, a lot of our elders, we did suffer, you know, from the pandemic, but I think that, you know, some of the projects that we're working on that really showcases who we are, um, that who I don't know, you, you've, you've probably heard of the, um, of the Three Sisters Garden that we're doing over in Lacombe. And uh, Ms. Tammy Greer, 
in in the group the uh, Boban, not the Boban, Bob, Bob, Bobancha collective, but um, also members of of our of our group. I can never remember the name. It's, it's a Choctaw name, but it's so long. <laughs> I can't remember. But uh, formerly the Dig group. But um, they they've come together and they helped uh, us build the Medicine Wheel Garden, and and we're building a chook out there. You know, is there's a lot of positive change that that I see that the parish council members want to work with us and and you know to bring awareness of our culture in Lacombe and stuff. And so just to see that change right there is very hopeful to me. And it just only you know, presents a prospect of, well, what, what doors are going to open in the future? What, what can we do now? You know, so, yeah. Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. But. Yeah, no, that definitely <laughs> answered your question. Okay. Yeah. I thought those are, those are my thoughts. Anybody else have, or, uh, I, I don't know if you have any, any questions you've been listening or uh, I don't have any, uh, but I just wanted to thank you, Sierra, for being so open with us and just so willing to share. I really appreciate that. Um, it's You're really welcome. This, thank you for uh, having me. Worthwhile. And uh, I know I have really enjoyed it myself personally. I will well, definitely. Thank you. I was definitely looking forward to this all day. I really appreciate it. It's just been a joy to listen to, listen and, and just to understand more about you. So really Have you all met before, really? And uh, oh yeah, we went on a car ride. What's <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we almost got lost. <laughs> that was a great yeah. ride. <laughs> That was that was so much fun. I'm like, we're gonna do that again. You grew, yeah. your sister grew up being friends with Joseph Darren Strick, didn't she? My cousin. Mm hmm Joseph had a crush on my mom. Wow. <laughs> well, not, let me tell you something. Our family's been knowing each other for over 40 years. <laughs> we're wow. we're neighbors. Wow. So yeah, I know his, I know Jeffrey's family very well. And y'all all look alike. That is very true. Yeah. <laughs> I can spot a Darren Berg a mile away. Us for a long time. My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a great ride. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so well, much. Thanks a great. lot. And then we'll, you know, of course, they're gonna. This is gonna take a long time to process. Like we're gonna hopefully, after you do the interviews, we're gonna have like transcripts and go over transcripts again and get everything loaded up. But um, you're the first one, and we thank you for bearing with us a bit and. We really, uh, this is great. Um, I did. Have, one for the for the first one that we kind of know, you know. Yeah. I had one question. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Right. So earlier you talked about you went to Ursuline uh, Academy or or whatever, um, and how they've since switched the mascot. When when did you go to school there? Just for a timeline kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, showing my age now. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to get past that and <laughs> slip by that. All right. You didn't give I was... us a five-year break. It makes you feel better. I'm class of 90, okay? Oh, shoot. All right. Dang. <laughs> I wasn't even a thought, man. No. <laughs> All right. I'm 48 years old. 48 years young right all right i was uh i was there from 2005 to uh, 2009 and the sioux name uh the sioux mascot wasn't changed i believe until 2019 2018 2019 around that time yeah i have i was from massive protests Hmm? i'm sorry Oh, I was just going to say that was from a, a lot of boycotting um, from the school, from the parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. I had one more question. Um, or Ida, did you have another question on that? That was it. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm noticed, I'm noticing a few things while you're, uh, while we were talking that I wanted to see if you wanted to talk about. I'm noticing your earrings and I'm noticing your backdrop. Oh, <laughs> they're beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
<laughs> Where did you get them? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, I I beaded them. I didn't beat my necklace though. I, um, but I beaded these earrings. Wow. These, you know, just yeah, just traditional oh, nice. earrings. And um, backdrop is just my blanket, you know, that hides my ugly wall. <laughs> Love it. So <laughs> that's all that is. That's beautiful beadwork. Thank you. So, yep. This one, uh, just some of the things I do to pass the time. It does. Like I just, I just get uh, a design in my head, and I'll just put on some music, and boop. I'm, wow. I'm done. Uh, I'm busy for a few hours. Wow. How long does it did it take you to make those earrings? So these, yeah, these are actually pretty short. This took me about, um, I want to say about a, two hours total. One hour. What? Time. Yeah, what? we'll see. Okay, so wow. <laughs> what is? Okay, I've been beating for about five years now. So you know, if, okay. if I had just started, you know, of course it would take me, uh, you know, a few days. Yeah. But um, I mean, it's just I, I think it's like four rows, four or five rows, and it's just okay. a little circle. So I what I do is I take a, a strip of um pellet and I just I do one, two, three. I, I bead them and then I cut it out. And then I, I back it on, I have this back on a uh, deer hide and then I edge it. And then once I edge it, then I weave them to, oh, let me get close to the camera. Yeah. And I weave them together Ooh. like that. And wow. then, uh, then I attach the hook to them. And then boom, you're done. It's like you, you get into a rhythm. Like once you get started, it, you know, you get into a rhythm and then it, it goes fast. So it's incredible. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess that's, I guess, we, guess that's it. All right. Thank y'all so much. Uh, um, I, I really appreciate uh, y'all having me. As we say in Ishikoi, thank you much. Yeah, this has been a um, joy. I'm really digging it. Yeah. <laughs> You're setting a, a high bar for, for the other ones. So. Uh-oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Good, let them work for it. Okay. <laughs>